Welcome to Go Clip. I'm Chad Rutherman. I'm JJ Artimez. Oh, man, you can't. And uh, what you're about to hear uh, is us putting a condenser mic in a car and then driving at highway speeds <laughs> on a highway. Um, so if you find it kind of unlistenable, that's totally fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of uh, sort of rumbling and things got picked up. Uh, and we did our best to clean it up, but like, eh, sometimes you can't really work it out. <laughs> By pudding, we of course mean we taped the condenser yeah. mic precariously to yep. like the side of the front dash. It was yeah. very impromptu, mm-hmm. so. Yeah. Well, it was something that we had talked about doing before because we. It actually stemmed from a conversation about Bayonetta that eventually turned into an episode. An episode because we 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 talked about Bayonetta on a car ride one time for like almost a full hour and that really heavily influenced the fact that we wanted to do a Bayonetta episode. So we decided to throw the microphone on, uh, record us talking. Obviously with the microphone it's not like completely candid conversation, but uh, what we end up with is I think uh, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, also, I listened to some of it with no headphones and thought it actually sounded a little bit better that way. Just, you know, if you were able to do that, try it out. Yeah, I, I found that noise-canceling headphones worked, mm-hmm. but having earbuds projects the the <laughs> rumbling a bit more into your brain mm-hmm. than, uh, than it does otherwise, so... Uh, if you skip the episode, that's fine. Uh, we're sorry that we're a week late on the Trauma Center episode. There were some scheduling issues, uh, but that'll come out next week, and then two weeks after that's going to be Hotline Miami. So we're in for a, a good ride. If you want to stick around and listen to this car-based chaos that we tried to make work here, just remember that if you skip it, you're not going to learn what rolling coal is or means. <laughs> so... Yeah, you get a real down home West Virginian conversation <laughs> about coal and trains and trucks, but not Gears of War. <laughs> we don't actually <laughs> talk about Gears of War. Yeah. In this one. that's not like a hint. Where yeah, yeah. the coal train. I just explained the joke. And that's bad. <laughs> Enjoy. All right, welcome to the inaugural episode of Go Clip. Uh, I'm going to be your driver for today. Uh, I'm Chad Rutherman. I'm J.J. Artimez, your passenger for the evening. And I'm your other passenger, Andy <laughs> Uh Alright, so first order of business, I guess uh, to explain, we're just going to talk while we drive somewhere uh, for, like, we. for like a full hour. Chad and is driving somewhere. Yeah. We are being chauffeured. I guess I'm being chauffeured. Andy is being my technical assistant to this whole situation. Yeah. Yeah. As is proper. As I, the king of Noclips. <laughs> JJ continues to be the most useless member of Noclips. <laughs> like all kings. <laughs> right. So, uh, actual first order of business. Uh, the most recent map that was revealed for Splatoon 2 <laughs> is is called Humpback Pump Track. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, That's the you, best thing you I've ever heard. No idea how hard it was to keep that inside of me <laughs> until this moment to get your actual reaction to that. I don't know if I want to give you an award or them an award. Yeah, I feel like if I sent something to the Nintendo Treehouse, they would like actually <laughs> accept it and be happy about the situation. No, we could send them a tweet. Yeah, I just said it's be like humpback pump track. <laughs> We're like good name, great name. <laughs> Splatoon 2. Hashtag squid, hashtag kid. <laughs> when I mean send them something, I meant like a physical object, yeah. not like a digital object. Oh, okay. Like send them a, like have that sent to them. <laughs> yeah. Make a plan. Have a metal struck with a number one fucking name of map like written on it. Is that how they make like awards? They strike metal things? Uh, well, I mean, that is the traditional way to create like a metal would be to, like, get an imprint and actually beat it into a metal object. <laughs> they, but, do it, yeah. well, they do it with computers, though, now. That's true, yeah. They strike okay. the metal with computers? No. <laughs> they use a computer they to imprint the metal. <laughs> right. Uh, we actually make, like, engravings where I work. Oh. So, oh. 
Maybe, maybe I can hook you up. You might be able to hook us up. Anyway, I guess a pump track in the uh, context of this is like a bike race course. What? That, okay. That's a bit of a stretch. I would agree. Uh, generally. I mean, it was worth it. They were reaching for the stars and managed to grab them. Yeah. Back <laughs> pump track. <laughs> but uh, on that note, on that stupid note, uh, we did all play these Platoon 2 test fires as well. Uh, did you, like, we've already, like, told each other our thoughts on this, not thinking that we would ever do, like, a news catch-up type situation. Particularly not when, like, the method of conversation involved our usual microphone in a lot of duct tape while barreling directions at high speeds. Yeah, you'd be correct. So, the Splatoon 2 test fire, uh, basically, Splatoon 1? Yeah. Am I wrong about this? I was actually kind of surprised about this. Like, Mm -hmm. I remember when images of the game was first revealed, along with the Switch or nearby it, if I'm remembering correctly, a bunch of people online were like, oh, this is just going to be like a remaster of Splatoon. They're just going to like board it. And I I was like really dismissive of those people. Like, they like it because the art style was different and, you know, just being like a general shitty person. Stretch to say, but well, the art style is different. different. No, no, no. I mean, like, like the. Sorry, I meant hairstyles. Like okay. the heads, they yeah. had stuff that didn't exist. <laughs> art styles. Well, well like sorry, I meant hairstyles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it I, definitely looked like it was updated more than a remaster. Right. So I was, I was being like the shitty internet guy who was like, no, this is definitely a sequel, definitely an expansion of this platoon formula. And then it is. It ended up being Splatoon 2, and I was, you know, hoity-toity about it. Uh, and now it turns out that Splatoon 2 is mostly just Splatoon 1.5. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we haven't seen the whole thing, obviously. Obviously. Uh, also, there's some, uh, like, uh, one of the Squid Sisters might be dead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would be surprised. I would be shocked. It would be such an unnecessary downer yeah. for a game that, like, for the majority of the people playing it, don't care. Yeah. What would be the point? <laughs> yeah. About what's going on with the Squid Sisters. <laughs> yeah, especially a game that's like heavily aimed at children. I yeah, think... to just kill one of the characters <laughs> up. For no reason. I think you guys might be underestimating, like, Nintendo's willingness to maybe tug at the heartstrings of idol culture with this one. Because keep in mind, this is a world in which there was literally concerts, like holographic concerts for the Squid Sisters in reality. Yeah, but, like, Splatoon is a lot bigger in Japan than it is anywhere else. Like, the Wii U... Like, a lot of their audience with Splatoon 2 won't have played the first one. True. Definitely true. So, like, why would they... But, like, that's, like, half your audience doesn't even get... Doesn't even know. I feel like we're both overlooking... Like, everyone is overlooking the fact that killing off a Squid Sister would be the most unnecessary thing. <laughs> yeah, it would be pointless. Because, like, your game is a multiplayer shooter. The Squid Sisters never really had anything to do with that. They were just, like, newscasters, effectively. And, uh... They were more than newscasters in the hearts and minds of thousands of gen. That's true. But no matter what they were in the hearts and minds of the people playing the game, they were not participants in the shooting. <laughs> So, like, the, one of them just being dead would be, like, it, it doesn't, it's it's a different thing. It's like if you watched an episode of a TV show, and then you watched another episode of the TV show, and on the second episode, somebody was like, a guy I knew died. And you'd be like, well, I don't know that guy. He's pretty irrelevant to the plot going on. So I'm going to choose not to care. It would just be depressing for no reason. Think of, like, all the scenes or like framed photographs of Callie or could be like held up to a screen. Is Callie the one that's supposed to be dead? <laughs> supposed to be open oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> oh that's that's disappointing because she's the, the better of the Squid Sisters. Yeah, oh, the better. When you said like supposed to be, I thought you sort of meant it in the way like should. <laughs> <laughs> like, is she the one that should go fucking die? That should she's definitely be dead. Worst character Splatoon 2016. I guess the, I think the biggest evidence that she's not going to be dead, though, is because if they did kill her off, that would be, like, 
an actually good reason to name it Splatoon 1.5, like based on the number. We have of sequence <laughs> sisters that they are. Yeah. The ratio of sisters determines the numbers. The total number of sisters in the game <laughs> series would be three <laughs> over two series over two games. Therefore, 1.5 makes sense. The next game could have like they could like go the boy band route and make it like a group of five. So it would be Splatoon, Splatoon 1.5, and Splatoon 4. Four? <laughs> I like that. That's good. Good. All right. I'm glad we're making appropriate recommendations yep. to like whatever. I guess the treehouse is the treehouse of the people. We have to direct is that what they, they actually call it the treehouse, don't they? Oh, yeah. It's yeah, an actual treehouse. That's like real dumb. Eh, yeah. Can we confirm? I, Not dumb? I think it's, I don't think it's like good or anything. I think it's pretty inoffensive. I agree. I'm like I'm pretty neutral to that. My ire is held off because every time I've seen the people who like work in the treehouse, they just seem like like self-aware kind of funny people. Like I, I don't like follow them or any such thing. That the audience is not really pointed to people like us. It's pointed to people much younger, like like the kind of people who would tune into Minecraft streams. Uh, but <laughs> okay. But, like, they seem self-aware about it, so I don't want to bash on them. They just seem like an adorable 25-year-old, and they don't seem, like, corporate homogenized in the way that so many of these, like, engage your fan base initiatives often become. Yeah. It, it seems like something that only Nintendo could really pull off in a way that wasn't stupid. But it's weird that it's actually, like, Nintendo that America... It's Nintendo of America that did this, right? Like, it's, it's not so much of... I mean, it is a Nintendo of America thing. It's always American people hosting it, or at least here anyway. But, like, I feel like it's got to be something that Nintendo of Japan came up with. I could see Miyamoto just, like, we like, we yeah. should have a treehouse. Yeah. 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 Nintendo you know, has, I like... what I like? Climbing trees. <laughs> it's true, like, when I was a kid, I climbed trees house. and everybody liked it. We're gonna move that. Let's make a new Zelda game where you can climb trees. Uh, Honestly, God, I don't even think this is like a joke or exaggeration. It's this not. Is, this is the guy who like proposed the visor system in Metroid Prime by asking like, <laughs> "What if Samus had the head of a bug?" Right. Yeah. Th this is. There was a a stream or not a stream, but like a showcase of Zelda like a couple years ago when they were first showing it off, where Miyamoto was playing it. And apparently, like, all he did was climb trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, he just kept climbing trees and jumping off. He was like, we have to make sure that... Well, it's weird because... And this is something that I hope doesn't come up in the podcast that we're about to record. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Climbing trees actually feels kind of like garbage in, in Zelda. Because you, you climb the tree and, like, you get stuck on, like, even just a minor piece of physics and you just fall off the tree. Or just, is that not everyone's experience? Do I just suck at climbing trees? I think you just suck at climbing trees. Maybe you're uh, climbing the wrong trees? Yeah. Most it, of the trees I climbed were like carnivorous really trees. Really big trees? Like, like, like they're like pine trees, so they're, like, there wasn't like physics built in. I think they're going to say coniferous, not carnivorous. They don't say carnivorous. <laughs> <laughs> trees that eat meat. <laughs> they're just like rooted into a fucking like plank steak. <laughs> But yeah, I only ever really climbed like the big fat trees that you can't cut down. Uh, and yeah, pine trees. I see I climbed like the regular tiny trees to get the well, apples yeah. on. Then it, it, if you start climbing something that's like turning you upside down, you it'll know, fall, like it, yeah. it'll fall. So you gotta climb it between the branches, but I always just sort of like jumped up like an asshole for the apples. I never like climbed the trees, I just like did like a stupid short hop and just tried to like swing my arms while I'm laying in the air. Well if you were a real asshole you would have just like cut the tree down, and then the apples would fall on the ground, did, and then you you'd leave actually, the wood. <laughs> did you guys actually cut down the trees? Uh, I mean, I kind of had to for a while. Because I just used bombs. bombs. Yeah. Bombs take so long. Though, yeah, I would bomb them, bomb and then I would bomb it again to, to turn get the it into wood. a firewood, because I didn't want to decorate my weapons. Let's not get too far into uh, Breath of the Wild, because we're about to talk about it for like probably two hours. Yeah, right. Janelle would be really mad if she had like a great like tree bombing story. <laughs> that we used up, yeah. yeah. Um, sure. We've never actually talked about the mechanics of the, of the test fire. I, I really think it's being a touch dismissive of us, even though it's broadly true. To just is, say that it's Splatoon again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what's the full list of significant differences that they added there? 
about to super jump, now you hit X to bring up a map. Is that really significant? That yeah, I mean, to a that's definitely, I mean, people were wondering what they were going to do about that. I mean, it's a definite change. Mm-hmm. What used to be the jump button is now the super jump button that brings up a map for you to jump. And the jump button's now the B button. Well, we're also still talking about just video games here. So if you've been playing Splatoon continuously since 2015, I can see this maybe being an issue for you. Yeah. But, like, the Dark Souls 3 DLC came out, and I kept drinking Estus instead of attacking because I'd been playing so much Zelda. And then, like, in Zelda, I kept trying to, uh... I'm sorry, in Overwatch, I was trying to, uh, jump with the ultimate button on the PS4 version. Oh, God. Which is terrifying, because you're like, I'm just going to take a short hop. I've got you in my sights. <laughs> you're like, ah, I fucked up. <laughs> Why were you playing the PS4 version of Overwatch without us? I was playing with you. So if you ever saw me do, like, a dumb ultimate, that's probably what it was. I thought I was jumping. Well, now you know how much I do not judge you. That's so. good, yeah. <laughs> Maybe they were all accidentally fantastic cults. <laughs> When I was, like, when I was younger, I never seemed to have that problem of, like, mixing up button, like, schemes for right. games. But, like, in the past few years, like, maybe I just, like, play games more frequently now. But, like, I remember it started with Shadow of the Colossus. I went from Shadow of the Colossus into Dark Souls. It just kept accidentally drinking Estus. Yeah. Because I can't remember what the button play on Shadow of the Colossus is, but... Pretty sure attack was square. But when I started playing The Witcher, same I did thing, the yeah. same thing. I, I would want to attack with the shoulder buttons, but instead that like does magic shit. So I was like, oh, it was bad. So anyway, I was gonna lose buttons. Yeah. <laughs> oh. The dualies. I mean, we all tried the dualies. But that's we? like yeah. we did. But that's like a different weapon. They did that throughout Splatoon's entire life cycle. True. Adding new weapons. The, so. the dodge roll is new, though. That's true, but it's a unique thing for a particular weapon. Yeah. If that's going to be a thing, fair. Like, if if you if there are different, like, new mechanics for each weapon, and we've seen this with the rollers. True, yeah. Uh, have been updated so that you can move a little bit faster if you keep rolling with them, um, which I think is a, that's just, like, I want to say it's a quality of life change, but it's actually just a buff. Like, yeah. It makes the rollers better. Uh... Also a little bit more, like, chaotic. I kept running out of ink way faster than I ever remember doing. Yeah. Well, also, when I was playing Splatoon 1, I almost always ran, like, nine small uh, ink saver mains. <laughs> so, like, it was, I was... I never ran out of ink in Splatoon 1. Uh, yeah, and also with the vertical flick, when you jump and flick with the rollies, is the whole thing as well now. I feel like that's about it. That's like the only thing I can think of. That's what about a, the ultimates? I well, mean, yeah. it's just new specials. Supers. Super specials. Super special ultimates. But over the lifetime, unless I'm remembering correctly, did they ever introduce a new special over the course of Splatoon 1's history? Not as far as I know. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, they're but not introducing new things because you're that takes it from a base understanding that this is just Splatoon again. <laughs> <laughs> to, to say that a new set of ultimates as part of yeah, that's not Splatoon adding. 2. It's not adding like a new mechanic. That's taking the existing mechanic of ultimates and just adding some new ones. Right. I feel like well, we have none of them are the same, are they? Not at least that, from the not, test not fire. from the test fire. Yeah. Right. And I feel like in multiplayer games like this, even when you're just being additive on things in your design with like new specials and stuff. Overwatch is a great example of this. Adding one thing new but keeping 95% of what's already there the same can still like completely flip the design oh, yeah. in the multiplayer. Yeah, game. I'm not trying to say that like it's the same game again, but I said it mostly feels the same as the first though. And I think it's telling about the specials they added because as different as they were around pound the jet Manta Ray Beam. Missile Launcher. Yeah, none of them, except maybe the Missile Launcher, 
seemed like something that actually had, that actually impacted the way you played the game compared to Splatoon. Yeah, like right. We were, I picked a splatter shot, and I, like, my complete crutch, since I had so much familiarity with it from the first game. Same here. Uh, and, I, and it was really just like playing Splatoon again, but with noobs again. We could have yep. noobs around to consume <laughs> for sustenance and Yep, I got to feel like a total badass. Like, I played, I think it was the second night, yeah. by myself, and I did not lose a match for the whole hour. I, uh, it felt awesome. I felt pretty fucking bad, because none of the weapons were months that I used. Yeah. So it was, like, a very, like, uh, kind of uncomfortable, like, all right, I kind of understand how to use the splatter shot, from like the single player mode where I actually used one. I did use the, the Splattershot Pro for a little while, mm-hmm. but that's about it. The thing that I like about the, the ultimates, or the, the specials in, in Splatoon 2's Test Fire, is that at least two of them affected your mobility, which is something that really only the Kraken ever did in, uh, in Splatoon 1. Depending on how you define mobility, uh, oh wait no, the, uh, the satellite thing wasn't a special kind of come to think of Yeah, that was, the beacon is just a, uh, is a sub-weapon. But yeah, you're right. There are a lot more things that are fleeing people around the map, allowing people to influence the map from greater distances right. than there used to be. Yeah, I mean, you could even sort of put the ray beam in there as like a, uh, as like, a, it's not mobility, but it's, it's wall hacks, like you're gonna shoot through walls at people. I don't I don't get the ray beam. You played so much more than I did. I only got in like, a single hour in one test fire. I don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing with the ray beam. I don't. I have no idea because it isn't like the the killer whale, no. which like once you get like good with the killer whale, you it's it's kind of like Diva's bomb. You just choose like, am I going to attempt to trap someone and kill them, or just get people out of this area? Exactly. And the manta ray is too thin. And too slowly to do that. Yeah, it does neither of those things. If the other person is extremely unlucky or extremely bad, they might die too much. And this isn't even like a balance question. I, I literally don't understand the design intent of the manta ray. Is it, is it for spawn king? Is that, the question <laughs> is, is that something that they want to encourage? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, you probably, obviously, have never tested because that we were kings who were never crushed. But well, uh, this, the, when we played with you, it was more normal, yeah. and I lost way more. But uh, that's the only thing I can think of, like, it would be a, an effective way to use it, is if there was somebody coming out of the spawn and you just, you know, ray, ray beamed them. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, uh, the the special for the, the roller that was the, the, like, superhero landing. Dude, sell me on superhero landing. Uh, well, it, there's one thing about it that I like. Well, one, I like how it, like, feels to use and looks. Because uh, it gets people, like, if somebody's all up on you, you just use it, and they're like, oh, I can get out of here. Uh, and that's nice. But it also gives the opposing team, like, even if it's not much, it gives them some pause before they spawn camp somebody who's super jumping in. Right. Because, like, that's, like, that's just a death wish, and it's why nobody ever used it in the first game. It's like, if you aren't if there isn't, like, a, everyone's holding and, like, ready to go in as a team and you super jump to them, you're just gonna die when you get, like, 99% of the time. And this gives you, like, if you didn't just spawn, you can now super jump in relative safety. That's a really good point. I guess the comparison I'm thinking of now is that if you use it exclusively like that, and I think that's gonna be the predominant way that people use it, the middle of super jumps, not just as, like, an emergency one. Because in my experience, it was not very good at being an emergency button. It's a little bit too slow for that. Yeah. But if you use it as like a, as an entry device, it's almost like an ink strike that moves you with it. It's like if you just grabbed onto the missile and so oh, yeah. it lands. Yeah. yeah, I felt like just using it on its own, it was way too slow and way too easy to punish. Yeah. Like, if, if someone used it near me, I was able to just like back up a little and then just kill them. Yeah, and probably kill them. It was basically, yeah, yeah. It was basically like just a free kill. Which is why you need the surprise of coming out yeah, of the stratosphere. <laughs> yeah, definitely an interesting spin. So by and large, our 
still positive on it being more Splatoon? I'm positive yeah. on it because, it, like, honestly, if it was just Splatoon 1 repackaged, like, literally Splatoon 1 made no changes at all. Maybe it's just, like, Splatoon Game of the Year edition on the Switch. Yeah. I would still buy it because it would mean more people would be playing the game. Yeah, I think it was successful enough on its first iteration that this is the right way to do a sequel to it, which is to just iterate on certain things and, and update certain stuff and new maps and etc. Like, probably the biggest thing that held Splatoon back from, like, wider success than it already had was the Wii U. Was the Wii U. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so far, the Switch seems to be doing all right, right? I haven't kept up much on, like, actual marketing numbers. Uh, I haven't actually looked at any legitimate sources, but I've seen some, like, ad, like, clickbait that are like the Switch is doing pretty well. Yeah, from what I've, from my understanding, the Switch is, is selling. Uh, I don't want to say like hotcakes, but like cakes. It's selling like cakes, like, cake like mix. warm <laughs> breakfast pastries. Like a lot of people are buying this concept. Breakfast pastries? Yeah, you know, like pancakes. <laughs> pancakes are a pastry. I would could call a pancake a pastry. Is this? Oh god, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but what about olive juice? Um, <laughs> olive juice is not a pastry. You don't know? try to freeze these things. I do know that. If there's one thing I know, uh, it's that we should probably... Actually, let's just go into the fact that... Uh, so the Switch is selling well. Yeah. Andy and I have a Switch. Yeah, yes. I'm poor and this ain't sad. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing. Uh, what do you think about the hardware itself? Uh, so far, I like it. Um, I, I, the portability is nice. Like, it's hard to really, like, un appreciate the portability aspect until you actually have one. Yeah. Uh, but, like, I noticed playing it for a while and then, like, going to play something on my PS4, like, I, and I wish I could just, like, take this, like, out to the couch and play it there. Yeah. Like, you know, like, it's something that's not, like, oh, mind-blowing, but it's, like, such a nice convenience that, like, you miss it when you go play on the you're understanding why I like uh, what or why I liked the 3DS so much, right? Uh, during my time with it, 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 like the fact that you can play it just sort of wherever you want to play it is a big thing. And I have the added bonus of working midnight shift and having usually some free time every night uh, to actually play things. And yeah, the Switch has been nice because Zelda's. When you play, like, because I'd been playing Pokemon before that at work, and at this point in a Pokemon game, I'm mostly just, like, sort of grinding, and Zelda feels like so much more of a full experience than, like, running Battle Tree. Yep. yep. Having, yeah, having the power of a home console in a portable is a pretty big deal. I feel like on the size comparison, this is something that despite all marketing attempts, it's still kind of hard to convey. Yeah. Because every time you look at, like, photographs for new technology, I think Apple might have, like, started to pioneer this sort of approach to, like, photography of electronic devices. To make something look cool, you often have to make it look sort of grand. And to make something look grand, you have to make it imposing, which means you get lots of, like, downward, low angle shots of, like, cool tech. At which an makes angle. It, yeah. It makes it impossible to know, like, its actual size. Right. Unless you sit there with a fucking ruler looking at Wikipedia yeah. <laughs> and do the geometry yourself. Well, and you know there are people that do that. Yeah. Of course. Well, most of the time, they will release, in it, like, with specifications, yes. they, you know, give you the dimensions of the thing. But, like, I want to say most people don't see dimensions and just immediately have a picture in their mind of how big a thing is. Of right. course. At least I certainly cannot. No, because I, when I, I opened don't see the box yeah. for the Switch, I was like, this thing is fucking tiny. Yeah. 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 It's definitely smaller than you think. Mm -hmm. But the docking station was shockingly small to me. I couldn't believe that, like, a full, like, major console, something that's being marketed, no, again, not to directly compete as the, the, the old Sony and Microsoft V Nintendo comparison goes, right. but something that's supposed to like be on a logo with those three different things. Right. It, it just looks like it looks like something completely different when it's set up in your home theater. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely smaller than expected, like both with the screen, the dock, and the Joy Cons. But 
I, I don't think it's like too small. Oh, no. Like, yeah, I think it feels good. Like, the screen being that size is nice. It's nice and portable. And, like, the only thing I would have worried about was the Joy Cons. Me too. But, especially attached to the screen, like in handheld mode, it feels really good. Yeah. And I think it, it feels perfectly, like, maybe not ideal for some people, but, like, perfectly acceptable in the grip yeah. as a controller. Like, I played Zelda for like 90 hours <laughs> with the Joy-Cons and the grip and it felt pretty good. Uh, my only complaints would be that like the travel distance on the analog sticks is a little short, which for the most part didn't bug me, but sometimes in combat I'd accidentally click it in oh, right. and like crouch and get hit. But now I have a Pro Controller so it doesn't matter. Right, true. Um, the Pro Controller is great by the way. But um, Overall, I'm really pleased with it. I like the user interface, too. Um, and, yeah, I think the hardware is of a high quality and perfectly, you know, solid. And now it's just all going to depend on the software. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. It's yeah. really amazing that, like, looking between, like, the Nintendo Wii and this thing, how much... Or, sorry, the Nintendo Wii U and this thing. Is how much the Wii U looks like something that I would get at Toys R Us, and the Switch looks like something I would get at like a convention in a room See, that's like set up to be all white. I kind of <laughs> a lot of people make that statement about the Wii U, and I kind of disagree with it. I feel like it's specifically the gamepad. It's the game. Yeah, I think it's the, the, the console yeah. itself. I think looks plenty modern and nice, sitting like, like on my shelf. Yeah, honestly, the thing, the weird thing with the Wii U for me was not, like, so we're talking about how the Switch seems, like, way smaller yeah. than you would think it would be, when Phil's so fucking truck was rolling coal, <laughs> you know, passes, fucking asshole. Wait, wait, did the truck actually have, like, the words rolling coal written somewhere? On no, the it's, it's literally, ro- okay, this is, is gonna be an important next, I'm leaving, I guess, that noise in, okay. so that I can get this explanation in there. Uh, so, we are from West Virginia. Yes. And in West Virginia, um, though evidently uh, JJ does not appear to be aware of this trend, there is a weird, like, movement among people who own big trucks putting, like, a fucking smokestack on the back of their truck (laughs) that just, like, bypasses part of the exhaust and just shoots fucking shit all over the goddamn place. Yeah, like, not, not literally shit. But like, like men, yeah, metaphor, like eighty percent shit, yeah. like things that would poison living beings. Right. It's just, it's literally just the exhaust, but worse. And they call it rolling coal. Really? Yeah. I don't know what the what why. Because it, it looks, looks like, like it's burning coal. Right. Okay. It, and they're doing. It, presumably, they do it as either and like active denial of of like global warming <laughs> and environmentalism where they're like you guys are stupid the world is fine this makes no difference at all <laughs> or they're literally trying to destroy the planet <laughs> either way or they're just like super into that whole like they're super proud of coal I'm you're not gonna allow that one. Yeah, I mean, no, I'm, not, hold on. I'm, I'm not suggesting like a pl- completely normal, rational person <laughs> put that on their car just because they like coal. Right. They also have to be an asshole. That's true. But like, you, you, there's like a total like asshole redneck guy who is like a coal miner would totally put that on his car. I think we're <laughs> underestimating the possibility here that people with like, like on classic West Virginia folk life actually finds that sort of, like, like diesel-powered gasoline black smog thing aesthetically pleasing. Like, that's... I feel like people look at things that just eject enormous clouds of smoke and right. are like, that's fucking cool. In the same way that, like, people in the 90s, and I think a little... Some people now thought that just trains fucking generally were cool. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. No, yeah, there was trains. a trip. My dad was one of these people. Well, like in the nineties. Yep. Yeah, train cult is a is a really huh. really big thing. It's still a thing that uh, you can find some places uh, among the people, and I don't. I, I mean this purely descriptively, not in any kind of derogatory <laughs> fashion. But it's one of those things that like people who are like on the autism spectrum often like really fixate about. It's like it's a, it's a very common like fixation for people to have like train love and now, interest in trains. Uh, I understand that. I just wouldn't associate it with the 
Yes. Fair enough. That's when my dad was the most into trans. It seems know. like something that would be like a 50s thing. But, you know... <laughs> well, that's like a, a like a technological marvel thing in yeah, the 50s. Yeah, well, this is why it makes the most sense. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, like, fetitiz- fetishization of trans, not, like, actual love of trans. Like the, roman- like, like the romanticism of travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mean, like, when you would go into, like, a movie theater or a public square and have discussions about trains. I mean, when you would go into, like, a really weird-looking shop in a strip mall. And, and buy, like, trains. model trains. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's the thing. Okay, so here's the, here's where this, I think, ties in. Is that <laughs> uh, the people who are doing the, the who are rolling coal, as it, as it were. Stupid firm. Yeah, it's really bad. I bet uh, they think it's super awesome. They probably think it's super awesome. But you have to assume that they're either dumb or an asshole because it's the equivalent of leaving your refrigerator open all the time. <laughs> like, just the 100%, like, taking the door like, of your refrigerator roll, roll, off. Rolling coal. Rolling coal. <laughs> 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 Fuck. Leaving the door of your refrigerator open has immediate costs to you, though, because it ceases to be a refrigerator if you can't close the door. Like, that, that truck still functions as a as truck. truck. Yeah. It's just eventually going to destroy something important. Whereas leaving the refrigerator open now uh. destroys something important immediately. <laughs> yeah, it's all about that delay. Well, I guess that's really a metaphor for the entire situation here. This person doesn't think that their short-term actions affect the long-term. Unlike somebody who closes the door on their refrigerator, <laughs> aka a sensible person. So I think that's what we're gonna go. With. Anyway, what, what were we talking about? The Wii U is like way longer <laughs> oh, than you yeah. would think it's gonna be. It like for some reason is this big board that yeah. you hold on to. I'm glad we're calling you this don't out. Hold on to. This is like the untold feature of the Wii U that like nobody talked about. Because no one talked about the Wii U ever. It's like a niche of a niche here. The, right. the Wii U console itself, not the pad, was like a, it was like a fucking, it should have a piece of wood. Like a short piece of wood. And I don't know why. Like, <laughs> DVD players almost universally on, like, game consoles and shit, the, the, when you put the disc in, it was always on the longest side of the rectangle, but they put it on the short side of the rectangle for this one. It just feels uncomfortable. It just makes, yeah. Well, it's weird because, like, I, I have my Wii U sitting on top of my PS4, and they're actually about the same length. <laughs> like, they're... It's weird that it's half the width. Yeah. So it actually is just smaller than most consoles, but it's it just, like, it's a weird... Because of the way they put the front of the console, yeah. it's kind of a strange thing to look at. It never really bothered me because I had the appropriate amount of shelf space Fair. or counter space or whatever. But then, like, to upgrade my memory instead of being smart and getting an SD card, I got a flash drive, and now it makes it even like stick out longer. <laughs> so that's inconvenient. But you know, overall, not a huge deal. Yeah, right. I don't think the length of the Wii U console actually, in most cases, hampered people's experiences. Like, oh, it, wasn't, no. it wasn't a worse console. It, it is, was a less pleasing, yeah. it was a weird console. It is a little weird. It's always a little weird, yes. It would be like if you bought a used Xbox 360, like, first gen, first run of those consoles, okay. and it had a faceplate on it that was designed to look like human skin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, this is a little weird <laughs> to look at. That's, that would be a lot of that would be a lot of weird. Like, no, not made of human skin. Like, I know. Looks like skin. That's still a, much weirder. I bet that exists. <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's like a full Xbox 360 skin that had like a scene from a porn on it, but they removed the part that was on the like body of the console. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. all that's like on the the base plate is like part of a thigh. It's <laughs> <the texture. laughs> yeah. it continued onward. The top would be like the flesh up box. through a waist into like heaving breasts, but it's not there. So it's just like the portion of someone's waist in between their belly button and the lower half of their body. So it's just a strip, relatively flat flesh. The flesh box. The flesh. Box. The flesh box. Yeah. yeah. The sex box. I is like this. Identified. This is a hypothetical flesh box person. is much grosser. <laughs> the the hypothetical person who was like, I have to sell my Xbox 360. I'll do it on eBay, but in order to make it more appealing, I'll remove 
the tacky porn skin. <laughs> and then they're like, well, eh, instead, I'll sell it on Craigslist, and then I'll get in my truck and roll coal over to where they are. <laughs> These are the same person. <laughs> yeah. The coal rolling sex box owner. <laughs> yes. The best person. And the only reason I'm, I'm fixating on sex box is because it's a thing that people actually accused the Xbox 360 of being. Oh yeah, there was like a whole... Like a porn machine? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You remember this? Were you like... like no, conscious? I don't. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> no clip history time. In, in, no clip trim. High school was kind of a low point for me in console gaming, so I kind of like skipped out on that generation a lot. Alright. Fair. Uh, during like the rise of Fox News as a culturally influencing entity. Okay, so like the mid-2000s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, they was this big story, big two people in gaming, of course, probably fucking nothing to Fox News, I assume, uh, <laughs> in which they ran a, a bunch of, like, essentially hit pieces on the original Mass Effect, because... Uh, the because Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, they, like, they showed images of, like, the, like, one-second in-and-out flashes of the sex scenes in Mass Effect for, like, like there's like alien butt for like some shots and stuff. <laughs> yeah. But because of the context they gave to it, they made it seem like they were taking like only the images that they could reasonably show on television, uh, not the fact that these two things were all of the images. Yeah, it's one hundred percent of what Bioware put in the game. Right. Yeah. So they called and they called it like the sex box and got like one of the lead like devs or something from Bioware onto debate a Fox person. He was just, like, confused the whole time and kind of alarmed as he would be. That's, like, a weirdly common trait of Fox News interviews. Yes. Is the person being interviewed being confused? Well, they do it that way so they can't make an intelligent argument. So they don't seem they, credible. They blindside yeah. them, yeah. But, 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 Which is but, weird that people keep, like, accepting the interviews. Well, you think, like, I'm going to go on and clear my name. Yeah. And then they're like, but what if aliens actually made the thing that you made? And then you're like... <laughs> Oh, fuck. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, I prepared me for the aliens. I mean, like, wasn't there, like, a similar... Well, not to have anything to do with Fox News, but, like, wasn't Grand Theft Auto attacked for, like, same things? Well, like, Grand Theft Auto was almost hit for the... Well, A, that you could actually kill hookers, and B, yeah. the hot coffee mod, a third-party uh, thing that someone created. That literally was a sex simulator. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. 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 But, but they accused Mass Effect, the video game... Of being a sex game. Of being a sex simulator. Yeah. Like, that was, like, its purpose it, of its existence. An alien sex simulator. Yes. Right. Yeah. Which, I mean, Which somebody exists. totally makes it. it. No, that totally already exists. Right. There's yeah, no yes. way that it doesn't. There's no way it doesn't. <laughs> but, like, a triple the Oculus a. Rift exists. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, all porn has become possible with the Oculus Rift. <laughs> <laughs> Not just imaginary on the internet and photographs, but, but truly real. A part of us. A part of our hearts. Porn has become a part of us now. I don't own an Oculus Rift, just for clarification. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be invited on to Fox News to explain those statements, then. Uh, explain. Uh, okay, right, yeah. Fox, huge. Yeah. So, we were talking about the Wii U. Oh, yeah, we were. Uh, and uh, it, at really the, at the, it's officially, you know, dead. Yeah. Buried in the ground. I believe it's the funeral us. ceremony was, like, a couple of... We uh, missed it. Yeah, a couple of months ago. Uh, we sort of, like, got well, the invitation for the Wii U funeral, and we're like, yeah. And we're like, I still got to finish her. Seeing as, yeah. <laughs> Seeing as we've all, we all own one, what are your, like, general thoughts on the Wii U? I actually still intend to play it. I have, like, four or five Wii U games that are, I think, are of note and would like to, uh, at least try. What are those games? Uh, okay. Uh, Yoshi's Woolly World. Uh... Yeah, thank you, Andy. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kirby's Rainbow Curse. Basically the cutest <laughs> Nintendo game of the hill. Uh, Zombie U. I've it's never horrible. never played yeah. <laughs> ne I've never played the Wii U version of Zombie, yeah. and uh, I've heard that it is like by far the best version. So I, I would like to do that. Um, I guess I can kind of give up on playing uh, Monster Hunter 3 because I downloaded it and now, like, there's a hundred more Monster Hunter games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesus. I get, like, other things that I would include are, like, the Minish Cat, because I have the virtual console <laughs> version. It's not really a Wii U game, but yeah, that's I'm, going really to, counts. I'm going to play it on the Wii U, though. What about you, JJ? In terms of games? 
Like, oh, just what do you think about the Wii U? Oh. If you were gonna, like, summarize it. Uh, they never, ever justified the screen. I can't think of a single game that made me go, oh man, I'm so glad I have this second screen tablet below the game. And I'm a person who, like, loved the DS in right. all of its iterations. I thought, like, the touch screen, the placement of those there is completely justified by a million different games and a million different styles over the years. But absolutely nothing ever made me thankful that there was that second screen there. Uh, and thus, I think the, the, that the core push to the console was was just a failure. Not not the console itself, but the idea that they were trying to like push and spawn with the Wii U, their whole big thing, just did not work. Yeah, and I guess to expand on that, I'm generally pretty positive on the console, but it does seem like they had like greater plans for it, but it was just never financially successful enough. So they just ended up kind of playing it safe. Like, so they never really took advantage of the console. They're like, let's just put out some games that people will like. Yeah. And like every time they tried to experiment with it, we got Star Fox Zero. Yeah, then, you know, like, <laughs> that, that's, the, like, the only time they really went all in on it, and they, like, fucked it up. Apparently, Zombie U uses the gamepad, like, really well. <laughs> Zombie U uses the gamepad as a way to divert your attention. It, like, forces you to look down, and it only keeps the inventory screen there but it only allows you to, like, know what's going on. There's no pause in Zombie U. Right. Uh, so this is a, as a, your distracted attention as a point of tension for when the zombies are going to, like, come around the corner and eat you while you're looking through your fucking sack. Which right. is pretty smart. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. It, is. it was a launch title. Yeah. So yep. good planning they on their part. really there. peaked early. They <laughs> peaked on day one. But that's pretty good. Cool. Yeah, I honestly think that I got into the Wii U at, like, exactly the right time, which was, like, two years after it released. Because I bought the game with Super Smash Brothers and Splatoon, which I still think are the two best games on the console. Oh yeah, easily. I, I got the Wii U a bit early because I'm a Nintendo fanboy. True. And I, but I still didn't get it like the first year. Like I, I got it when Mario Kart 8 came out. Right. Around then, like right before, and I got it with the Wind Waker one. I'm trying to. And like, it. I think that's one of like the biggest like failings of the Wii U, and I don't know if they fell back on this approach because it didn't get third-party support, but it seems like a console that specifically appeals to only Nintendo fans and, like, not to a general audience. Like, all the good games for it, like, I feel like only maybe, like, Bayonetta 2 and maybe, like, Xenoblade Chronicles X are, like, be, like AAA games for it that appeal to people other than just hardcore Nintendo fans. I agree. I was about to bring up Bayonetta 2 as another example of, like, Maybe something else that could be among the best yeah. games for that. Yeah, like, that's interested yeah. in like the platinum game fighting style. Yeah, yeah, like there's nothing else to like draw in people who aren't already Nintendo fans. There's a wonderful 101 on the Wii or the Wii U. That's the Wii. That's the Wii. Yeah. And like that's what from the that's same. Capcom, isn't it? No, that is, that's a platinum game. Oh, it's platinum. Yeah, that's oh, platinum. Yeah. Uh, it's it's very much like in the vein of Beautiful Joe in terms of its visual style. Mm. That could be why I thought it was Capcom. Yep, yeah, it's all little people in like. GP superhero outfits, but there's just millions of them. Yeah, in I mean, and that also, I think, just kind of appeals to a Nintendo fan base. Right, right. In terms of its aesthetic. Yeah. The, yeah, there are lots of things. I, I actually am going to double down on that statement and say that, like, yeah, I think you're 100% correct that the Wii U is a console for Nintendo fans and really not for other people. Nope. The people who are playing. It's basically, if you are the kind of person who cannot not get a Smash Brothers game... Right. Right. Uh, you were playing Splatoon. <laughs> or just, like... Anticipating Zelda. Yeah. Which never came. Which never came, <laughs> and you could have just gotten the Switch. Which I think is kind of a tragic thing, because... That's also... That's another big nail in the coffin for the Wii U, is it essentially didn't have a 3D Mario, and it had no Zelda. Yeah. Yep, yep. Because it had, like, had 3D weird. World, which was a sequel to a DS game, so it didn't feel new and exciting. And so had, I was just like, eh, I guess I'll get that. Yeah. And it, it had, like, a multiplayer focus on a console that ships with one controller. Yep. Uh, They're like, you have a million Wii remotes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you fuck. Good <laughs> <laughs> selling point. They were, they were correct about that. We all have infinite Wii remotes <laughs> hidden around our electronics somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, like, yeah, no, right out of the gate, they're like, oh, we should put those things on the Switch so that people buy it. Yeah. 
which is a smart move. Though, I gotta say, I am a little bit sad because for like, because the Switch came out in this sort of mid console cycle yeah. situation. Because Wii U also came out early. Nintendo has just like ditched the cycles entirely. Yeah. And it's just sort of like rolling on their own schedule. Rolling pole on their own schedule. <laughs> they, uh, um, they installed like uh, exhaust pipes on the Nintendo <laughs> headquarters. <laughs> their um, office building. <laughs> um. I'm hoping that the way that you edit it, you're going to put Rolling Coal as, like, at the end somewhere, and there's going to be a million references in the middle of the class to oh, Rolling no. Coal. I'm putting Rolling Coal right where it was, because <laughs> that's an important discussion. Um, but, so, like, the Switch released in its, in its own little, like, bubble, and I feel like this is the, like, Breath of the Wild is the first Zelda game that really appeals to, like, not just Nintendo fans. Well, Zelda's always kind of had, like, the intrigue factor. Like, the, any time a Zelda game comes out, there's people who are like, oh, the Zelda game looks cool, but it's never really had that hook to pull those people in. Right. And Breath of the Wild totally does. Oh, yeah. Breath of the Wild can be sold mechanically in a way no other Zelda game. Yeah, because, like, not only is it, like, the open world, but it's also, like, the emerging gameplay that, like, people are all the f- like physics systems, yeah. which Far Cry 2 was all about in many days ago. Well, it's okay. We're gonna have to just shut the fuck up because yeah. we're about to talk about this game for a long ass time, and this is kind of a big thing. But yeah, those are those are immersive sims. Uh, is like the subgenre title that Zelda falls into, and uh, I'll explain more when we get to it. But that kind of a thing appeals to. Um, much older audience than Zelda games typically try to. Yep. And Zelda and this Zelda game is clearly recognizing the fact that most Zelda games are Zelda players rather are older than the games lead themselves on to to portray. You know. Uh, there's like yeah, there's always I think Nintendo's held on to that idea that like they're marketing video games to children mm-hmm. for like way too. And, like, it's kind of been to their benefit, because it's given them this unique kind of aesthetic and unique kind of, like, quirky characters and stuff. Yeah. It gives them, like, a, like the protagonist in an animated film kind of vibe. Yes. Yeah. Where, like, because Miyamoto is essentially, like, a, he's a 70-year-old man who just only wants to make other people have fun. Yeah. And he wants to make people smile. Yeah. You can tell. And the idea of, of Nintendo as a game company is basically, like make fun games, not like, let's make experiments or like, weird, like, they want to make fun games, and the path to that is through their experimentation, which occasionally is the fun bullshit in the case of like Star Fox Zero. Yep. Uh, <laughs> but the, it's just like, because they put themselves out like that, we can forgive something like Star Fox Zero and be like, ah, they just had like a shit game, it's fine. They just wanted to make us you know, it makes us seem like the bad guys if we're talking shit about a bad Nintendo game. Yeah. <laughs> like, they were just trying to make this happy. <laughs> 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 it's important to point out, though, how rarely they truly do shit the bed like that. Oh, yeah. it's true, yeah. Like, I have no idea why that project didn't get killed. I don't know enough about it's, the management systems. I, but they normally kill their shit. Yeah, I've heard that it started as, like, an idea for a flight simulator for the Wii U. Right. And they like applied Star Fox to it. I I don't I don't know why they were so adamant to like push it out when it wasn't working. Oh man. Think of how good like a Wii U flight sim could have been if it was modeled in that like Wii era Nintendo style, with, like the Wii Fit trainer and like generic human beings put everywhere. That actually it does was, sound kinda of sweet. It sounds amazing. Yes. yes. Though that's like a said, they, they market it as like a pilot wings flight sim or something. Yeah, like right. you have like the Wii Fit pilot and like yeah. just a blank face. It's, it's like, like yeah, the Wii Fit trainer. It's like Barbie just designed a different outfit. Right, right, right. <laughs> what, yeah, what we needed, what what we needed was uh, like a. It's called like it's a pilot wings game, like pilot wings U, pilot wings, uh, <laughs> pilot wings, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, 
it, it has like a set of like mini games like you would find on like Wii Sports Resort or something mm-hmm. that have like a progressive challenge but are pretty simplistic and then just expert mode <laughs> and expert mode is just a flight simulator with the touch screen got all the buttons and switches but yeah the touch screen has to like simulate your eyes when you're looking down while the up screen you have like a third person or like an in the cockpit view yeah, yeah it's because yeah, it has to like, be around to find the buttons on the, yeah, like, like the, the like the like in the black water did yes where it's like you can like actively move it around and, yep. and do different things and that would be so good <laughs> and they would need to package it as a piloting game in order to justify spending nintendo development <laughs> yeah it. but a nintendo flight simulator would probably just be the best thing <laughs> on the wii u because it would be it would be intuitive and complex at the same time and that's exactly what a flight sim needs to be yep. i like the idea that andy brought up that like the Wii Fit Trainer becomes the party of Nintendo. Or, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very appealing idea, actually. Because they just called it like the Wii Fit Trainer. Because right? like you can also imagine like imagine like Surgeon Simulator. Like it was like you know like the Wii Fit Trainer is now a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You just like you have a stylus on the touch screen to operate and but, stuff. Well, but uh, writes itself. Barbie already has a name, right? Like yeah, Barbie, Barbie has, a, has a, something that it can be advertised as. Yes. But the Wii Fit Trainer is only defined by its position relative to the game and console it was on. Yeah. Right? So, like, what do you call the Wii Fit Trainer abstracted from the Wii Fitness and Training? I think you just keep calling her the Wii Fit Trainer. <laughs> <laughs> like, Pilot Wii Fit Trainer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they do kind of write themselves into a box with that name. And that's, like, way funnier. <laughs> it is really funny. Or, like, actually. she could be, like, the Wii Fit Pilot. <laughs> and, like, the Wii Fit Surgeon. We know, yeah, Wii Fit, Wii Fit prefix title as, like, the uh, the last word is, I think, the way you go with this. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, we have to, it's not that she's all about fitness, it's that she remains fit yes. every she's she yeah, very fit <laughs> I, I can see why they she didn't cares really, about your fitness they yeah. didn't really plan for this I don't think <laughs> until uh, Smash Brothers they were really like oh this is going to become a seminal character yeah this is a reoccurring character right? yeah they sort of planned for her to be uh, it's, let's call it a blank slate yeah, character. Yeah, completely Considering she has no features whatsoever <laughs> I think has, that's like, a, a face, fair kind of face. right she has like a, a, a face thing Okay, sorry. Checking a text message. Uh, not driving currently. Well, Please don't <laughs> yeah. arrest me. Checking a text message while driving and recording a podcast <laughs> with people in the car. It's all good. We're totally responsible. We're at a, we're at a total stop. I think it's all right. Do you think maybe we could get out like a camp stove here and we could like put it up in the center and like cook some eggs? <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Just, just get a can of it's Sterno. Long, I've got a lighter back as there. As long we'll as just, Chad like, is the one cooking it. Yeah. <laughs> while driving. <laughs> And checking a text message, checking the recipe on my phone. Yeah, I mean, well, you gotta, you gotta make it right. Yeah, <laughs> this is the Go Clip Safe Cast. Uh, they could do like a Wii Fit slash Cooking Mama crossover. <laughs> Who owns Cooking Mama? I have no clue. Uh, Janelle does. <laughs> no, no, no! I don't mean the video game. I mean the IP. The IP. Oh. Intellectual property right. Cooking Mama. Who makes? I Cooking forget Mama. where Cooking Mama came from. Japan. <laughs> Japan is not a who, Andy. <laughs> That's what you think. I mean, you're not wrong. It did come from Japan. Like uh, everyone here has a phone, and I'm driving, so yeah. I cannot look it up. It's not. It's not that. We're gonna. We're gonna continue the tradition of not looking things up okay. when we say we will. Um, we don't have the break. Do we, I mean, That's true. We don't have a break. Do we have like because of the proximity to our destination that we're at right now yes uh, is there do we have like sh- any short like uh hot takes on some gaming news we crack open the open the no clip egg and just yes. like let some things sizzle a bit before it off the grill yeah because the only thing that i wanted to talk about other than that was the dark souls dlc and obviously yeah. you haven't played it yet yep uh, it's killing me not to talk about yeah uh, it always and, and, from software always murders you. Whether you're playing it or not, it's always just death. Oh yeah, there's some areas in the in the new DLC where it's it's like, I understand that you want me to get good. How good do you need me to be from software? <laughs> it, this was uh, like overall impressions. This DLC was was hard. Yep, I think <laughs> it's the hardest piece of Dark Souls content. 
Ever. Yeah. Personally. But overall, I thought that I liked it uh, more than Ashes. I mean, I can't really compare it to any of the Dark Souls 2 DLCs. Yeah, I liked it also more than Ashes, but then less than any of the DLC from any of their other games. Yeah. I think Artorius and uh, the, the Old, Old Hunters, Hunters are kind of a, like, that's not fair. Yeah. Because those, those are, are like, fantastic. Yeah, those are like masterworks of downloadable yeah. And content. even like, the Dark Souls 2 DLC is even like the best parts of that game. <laughs> like, they, are, they stepped up their quality for those. Yeah. I will say that, it, at the very least, uh, the Ring City does not want you to have any weapons that are not fully upgraded. I, yeah. I believe that in one playthrough I got seven slabs and, like, 85 uh, chunks of Titanite. Jesus, Knight. from just, from just the DLC. DLC. Well, I, did, I did not find that many slabs. I maybe got two of them. Okay, you missed a lot of slabs. There are three slabs in the last area alone. Oh, wow. And you know how small the last area is. Well, okay, maybe, yeah, I got one there. <laughs> maybe I got more than I thought. It's possible that you got track how many. Because I was like, I, I got a weapon, and I was like, I, I kind of want to, like, upgrade this. I wonder how many slabs, I was like, I'm pretty sure I have, like, two slabs left. It's like, four slabs. It's like, what? Yeah, I actually think, I can think of at least four. Yeah. There's a bunch. It's a, you get, like, a billion of them. It's, it's absurd. Uh, but that's all I yeah, had to say about like, that. And, like, enemies drop Titanite chunks, like, Left going right. out of style. Oh, yeah. Well, it is going out of style. It's going yeah. so out of style that they're not making Dark Souls anymore. Well, <laughs> that's that's what, the reason. That's what they say. Probably, that's what I say now. Yeah. Give it a couple years. Yeah. And they'll, they'll chain up all the members of From Software and make them make it, so. <laughs> I'm really worried, like, really worried that Miyazaki right now Miyazaki, the Dark Souls creator, for, for reference. Not Studio Ghibli. No. Right. Uh, is going to become, not in style, but in, like, Kojima? the way politics and life has affect him, affected him, just like, uh... Fuck. The, Ko S Sakurai? No, Kojima? Kojima. Oh, He's going to become okay, just yeah. like Kojima. He's not going to want to make it, and they're going to keep making him make it? Yes. Yep. And that's going to cause, well, like, all these weird problems. I feel like work. that's kind of already happened. Like, I feel like he really didn't want to make Dark Souls 3. Yeah. Uh, this is something and, like, that I'm not going to get into he, because JJ is in the car. True. Like, he's already, like, he he's so good that the game turned out good anyway. Right. But, like, I feel like he's out of ideas for this series. Well, I hope that this means that whatever happens next is Miyazaki's death stranding. Like something yeah, where something crazy. Like two years before it's released, everyone is like, "What the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> Miyazaki can't have a Death Stranding. He doesn't have a style defined independently of his mechanics sense. That's true. Like I can look at Jeff Standing and be like Jeff Standing. <laughs> 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 Overwatch, Naruto, uh, Team across the way. But yeah, I can look at Death Stranding. <laughs> And I can be like, yeah, Kojima, he definitely made that. That's definitely his that handiwork. It smacks of Kojima. But I mean, you could say that it things... It smacks of Kojima. Yeah, it smacks of Kojima. Yeah, Kojima you could say the that, meat that hits you. But yeah. you could say that a game smacks of Miyazaki as well. How? I think... Because of the we huge had... difference between the Dark Souls games, like, where okay. he was there and he wasn't there. Yeah, I, I feel like it's kind of hard to imagine since we haven't really seen it. Mm. But, like... I think another game, like, directed by him, you'd be able to tell it was him. Yeah. I mean, you can tell with Bloodborne. Like, if you yeah, play Dark Souls, you play it, Bloodborne. It's also, like, like an action RPG, though. Yeah. Well, I think that that is his style. I think that the, the system that they came up with to play a Dark Souls game is in itself part of his... Like, I don't think that he's unhappy making games that play like Dark Souls. Oh, no, I don't either. I think he's unhappy making Dark Souls. Yeah. He's quoted in reviews, uh, not reviews, excuse me, interviews recently as, as saying that the next thing that he's working on, uh, he's, quote, not going to care whether or not it's like Dark Souls. And that's a really vague quote that could be interpreted in either of these two directions. I've heard right? that yeah. currently they're working on an Armored Core game. Because they, they want to bring that back. Right. Fucking please. Uh, <laughs> and then they're, they're working on something like a, like a new IP, and that's probably the one he was talking about. And I've also heard that they're working on like another like Souls-like action RPG. Yeah. 
or at least an RPG that will probably be sold for it. <laughs> right. So that's what I've heard. I don't know exactly how true that is. Did you guys ever have the life experience where, like, you were at a sleepover when you were like eight, and someone brought out Armored Core? And you were, like, <laughs> no, I actually never. I've never played Armored. Core. I had never heard of the series until I got into Dark Souls. Okay, I have a weird affiliation in my life between sleepovers and Armored Core. Okay. Like, not not even with the same group of friends. It's not like I had one person who, like, had Armored Core and was the one shitty PS2 game he had that we always played. Like, I just had lots of friends that had Armored Core. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing else, apparently. <laughs> that, or maybe I'm forgetting that I was just, like, super into Armored Core. It does kind of seem like something you would like to me. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, maybe you should <laughs> go back to Armored Core. I think you should go back to Armored Core. I think that you would probably enjoy that game. Maybe they should totally make Effort Grace 3. <laughs> let's, let's, let's not get into it. Actually, speaking of things that JJ likes, and hopefully something that won't take, like, forever to talk about. He is. Uh, I'm actually super fucking curious. Did you play uh, Fire Emblem Heroes? I played Fire Emblem Heroes for one day. Okay. Do you have thoughts? Uh, yes. Yes, I do have thoughts. I bet, I bet JJ could do an entire podcast on just that question. That's true. Well, I bet I could just buy myself. Just, that's what I'm talking about. Like a what's that? What's that asshole? It's not Bright Bart. The, the dude who what's that the, the crazy dude that Trump cares about? Uh, who like screams constantly? Oh, uh, Alex Jones. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could do like an Alex Jones style podcast okay. by myself about just the state of fire. I'm gonna let you roll on this one unless uh, Andy wants to interrupt with anything because. Uh, like, weirdly, though, I don't really care about Fire Emblem as a series, mm -hmm. I find it just endlessly interesting to hear people who are into Fire Emblem <laughs> talk about it. Well, I don't know, I'm not hugely invested in it by any means, but, like, I feel like the series has become pretty financially, like, viable when it used to not be. It's it's not just viable. It's, like, one Successful, of the primary yeah. IPs now. They've announced so, tons of movies. I feel like if they run it into the ground right now with their current trends, they're eventually going to go back to the way it was. Like, good touchstone here? Today's April Fool's joke, like Nintendo's April Fool's <laughs> joke, yeah. is them announcing a new Fire Emblem game in the style of the SNES games, with like their old SNES artwork. Yeah. It's, it's like, a, like a reboot to that old style that they used to have. <laughs> Which, you know, good, nice good spit in the eye to me, of course. Yeah. But, uh, but like, that's... Like, they That's can a make their them. joke yeah. about, like, yeah. old fucking Fire Emblem shit that was never released in the United States. Right. That's how much awareness that they're, like, confident that people have about the series. Yeah. I, just, I feel like they'll, there will be a return to form because the core fan base wants it. Right. I mean, I don't know what the general reaction to, uh, to Fates and its, like, whole See, sequence I, I, I feel like Fire Emblem Awakening, like... I felt like everyone was talking about that game when it came out, mm -hmm. and Fire Emblem Fates like feels like it came away and no one said anything. This so is correct. I think that's a pretty big indicator. But that's in the popular culture, right? That that's Awakening was being talked about by people who never cared about Fire Emblem before. Right. But people did not, at least broadly speaking, continue to care with Fates. Fates got like initial, a lot of initial media attention, but wasn't influential afterwards in the way that Awakening. Yeah. Dude, you know what would be great? Yeah. If they did a Nintendo Switch, like, original Fire Emblem game that actually looks like the cutscenes do in the DS games, like the 3DS games. Yeah. yeah. That would be incredible. It it, would, it, at least visually. In the, it would be, it'd be interesting. Because it, it's been a long time since they've tried to do things 3D. It's, it's been since the Wii. And even when they made uh, a Radiant Dawn for the oh, Wii... The, uh, the... Actual like in game like sprites and stuff could still be like I don't know. I feel like you could do a hybrid where like some sprites were still like the illustrations and like some stuff was the 3D models. Mm -hmm. But I think that would be pretty pretty awesome. To clarify the fate stuff, because that's a really weird situation. You said earlier that like you think that it's going to return to form because well, the core fans. I want think it? it's inevitable that it will happen eventually. I think because like, I think Nintendo games like look what happened with Zelda. 
Like it, it's been a long time coming. Like there's this, been this section of the fan base that's wanted to return to like the open endedness of the original, and it eventually happened. And for like however many years, people have been wanting like a return to like Mario sixty four style with Mario, and now it's happening. Like I feel like Nintendo franchises are the ones that people get really vocal about, <laughs> and if they piss off their core fan base enough there will be enough of an outcry for it to return to the way it was, and it eventually will. But this is my point. I think right now, still in the, like, post-Awakening Fire Emblem world, we're going through a time where Fire Emblem's core fan base is literally being re-established. Yeah, so, like, there oh. are people like me who weren't... Like, well, okay, I should correct that. <laughs> there are not all people who like those games were, like, rabid like me, but there used to be a very distinct difference between the kind of people who like Fire Emblem now in the post-Awakening world and the kind of people who liked Fire Emblem when it was, what the fuck is this person in Smash Bros. Right. Like, I, 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 and we're still watching that sort of shake out completely in terms of, like, what voices are going to have, like, the most influence. I, to make, like, a, a really vague comparison, which I assume I will one day elaborate in my angry Fire Emblem cast. <laughs> um, it's like the kind of people who are into Fire Emblem went from almost nobody to the same people who like uh, like Atlas's games and like Shin Megami Tensei. Yeah, like Persona. Like that's the market that is now becoming like core, so to speak, and like yeah. an Awakening Fates world. I, just, I feel like it's got, this franchise has a lot of steam right now. It does. I just, I feel like that's not going to have legs. I feel like that's going to run out and they're going to go back to what they know. That's just my prediction. I might be totally wrong. So my question then is, does the mobile game Fire Emblem Heroes <laughs> totally reestablish itself as a fantastic Fire Emblem game in the franchise? <laughs> the mobile game Fire Emblem Heroes uh, became a grind fest in under three hours. Oh, wow! The mobile game Fire Emblem Heroes uh, was trash so fast. And keep in mind here, for standards, I'm sure people are gonna like vomit in and out of this car when they hear this. Mm -hmm. I still play Pokemon Go. I, I do as well. I still enjoy that game. So I'm not I'm being like anathema to, to like micro payments, anathema to like mobile game grinding and that sort of style of development that's become so big. Mm -hmm. I've, I'm critical of it, like everyone who actually fucking cares about games. But I don't think it's unsalvageable in the way that a lot of people do. But this game is definitely unsalvageable. Definitely, definitely pandering. Uh, and ugh, it's it takes more from Clash of Clans than it does from a Fire Emblem. I saw a tweet tweeted a tweet tweeted out. Uh, <laughs> a tweet tweeted. Yeah, I, I saw a tweet posted by the official Nintendo Twitter. Um, that was an ad for Fire Emblem Heroes, mm -hmm. and the ad looked like an ad for Ebony Online. Like, I was like, this is, I think we might be going too far with the, uh, with using, like, one of your more well-respected IPs to whore yourselves out. Yeah, it does seem, like, very much just, like, a cash-in, in the mm -hmm. way that, like, Super Mario Run did not. Well, it's part well, of... Super Mario Run costs $10, which is bullshit, but... It, I don't, I don't know if it's bullshit. Yeah, 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 yeah. We are too close to the end of this trip to have this, to have this conversation. Yeah. yeah. But mm. on Heroes... It, it still looks like a good game. It's actually kind of an interesting comparison there, because the kind of people that they were pandering to was actually a pretty big extent. Like, the marketing pandered to the same new audience that has allowed Fire Emblem to not die after Awakening, which is the, like, Persona-style, like, you know like visual novel almost sort of Japanese people market and like all the ads for example of heroes are either the like handful of unique people or all of the ads either show off the, <laughs> all of the ads yeah, 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 yeah. We'll finish, we'll finish. all of the ads uh, either show off like the very small number of unique character designs they made for the game or the character designs from, like, the last two games, the ones that have allowed them to live. Mm -hmm. uh, but they really are trying to also pander to people like me, where one of the main, like, selling points of the game is we took lots of these old characters from the older games before they looked this pretty, and we gave them completely new art and, in some cases, limited voice lines. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. I've... 
it's been a good deal of time since I tried Heroes, because again, I dropped it in one day. But <laughs> I, I remember my initial touchstone for the game being like, because I'm not a guy who was like ever even fucking downloaded Clash of Clans, uh, was this feels like a, some kind of like pretty anime person collection game. It's not a Fire Emblem <laughs> game. It's like a slot machine for beautiful fictional people. Uh, that's a little gross. It is pretty gross. Mm-hmm. It has been gross since Fates. More later on my I don't like Fates rant one day in the right. future. 